Luke 5, 27 through 32. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of the tax collectors and others whom were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat with drink drunk why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repent. As we've been stu or talking about the apostles, one of the things to me that stands out is all these men were ordinary, unrefined people, except with the exception of Judas Iscariot. They were all from the area of Galilee, which was a region that was known for the people being the commonest of the common people uh, in that area. And I think Jesus intentionally passed over the aristocratic and the people of influence when he went to pick his followers. And you know what that tells me right off the bat? I'm in good shape because I'm a commoner. <laughs> I'm nobody fancy. I'm not sophisticated. I'm not uh, all these other things. I'm just a common person. And every one of us as common people should realize we're the type of people that God really is calling to do things for him. And that's the way it's always been in God's economy. He exalts the humble. And as Isaiah 25, 5 states, he brings down those who dwell in the high and lofty cities. I think it was Thomas Jefferson once said, the ruin of America will be people congregating in cities. They needed to stay out on the farms and out where they're separated somewhat. And God told Israel this it's in Zephaniah 3.12. He says, I will live, I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. God says, I'll take all the wealthy, uh, educated, sophisticated people out and leave a meek people in the land. I think it goes without saying that God works with the humble. When we become lifted up with pride, we no longer pay attention to God the way the humble people do. You know, if you're rich, you end up defining, or a lot of times, you are defined by trusting in your riches. That's what you do. If you are humble and don't have those means sometimes, you look to God for your help. You know, when you've got it all going for you, you kind of tend to ignore God a little bit. We don't need him as much. I think that's why Jesus disdained the religious criticism or elitism of his day. They were so spiritually blind that when Jesus came, they didn't even recognize it. They knew what the scriptures said, but they couldn't recognize Jesus as fulfilling those scriptures because they were so high and lifted up. Uh, with their own elitism. Uh, Jesus, they, they never, by the way, they never denied his miracles. They sometimes question where they came from. They never denied his miracles. Uh, in fact, I think they would even have accepted the fact that Jesus walked on water if it hadn't been for the fact that when he walked on water, he called them sinners. That's what they didn't like. They didn't like the fact that Jesus labeled men sinners, and especially them. They were so self-righteous, they couldn't accept the reality that what they were doing was sinful, and instead they choose, chose to crucify him instead of accepting him. And I think that kind of brings us to our apostle for the day, and that is Matthew the publican. Who was this man that wrote the book of Matthew that we have in the scriptures? 
In actuality, we know very little about him. In his own Gospels, he only mentions himself twice. One in Matthew uh, 9, 9, uh, when uh, he records his call. And again in Matthew 10, 3, when he lists all 12 of the apostles. That's the only time he mentions himself uh, in his book. Now Mark calls him another name, uh, and so does Luke. In Mark 2.14, Mark says, <clears throat> And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. It's, also, it's interesting that Luke called him Levi in our scripture reading, but uh, when later on he lists the 12 people, he calls him Matthew. He calls him Matthew both in Luke uh, 6.15 and in Acts 1.13 where he gives those lists of apostles. In fact, in the list of apostles, uh, the fact that Matthew... Uh, is listed by his profession, and he calls himself many times when he met, or those times when he mentions himself, he talks about him being Matthew, the tax collector. But the other apostles, Luke or Mark, usually don't do that when they list the twelve. Uh, people wonder, well, why was that? Because probably because he considered himself and his profession as being sinful and something he shouldn't have been involved in. Uh, Matthew, as we said, was a publican. Those are the words Jesus used from him, and it's in the King James Version anyway in their translations. Uh, what does that word mean? Publican? It means tax collector. It means the IRS, guys. Except it was a little different back then. That's all it meant was a tax collector. He collected for the public good, supposedly. So he was called a publican. But that alone made him a more notorious sinner than any of the other apostles. Now in life, he was humble, self-effacing man, as we can see in things that we know about him. And he kept himself in the background uh, during the time of their ministry on the earth, the time he followed Jesus in what we know about him. We know because he only mentions himself twice in the Gospels. And when he does mention it, he mentions he was a tax collector to illustrate how despicable his sins really were. Now, I want you to think about this occupation for a minute. You know, I don't think uh, Pastor Don Ward, retired now, but for a long time, the pastor in Peculiar, Missouri, or he used to be can't think of it now. When it was there, it was a different name when we were there, but it's a peculiar now. But Don worked for the IRS in Kansas City. That was his second job. Now, I don't think he would have come under this role because it's a different situation than what it was back then. These people back then were the most despised people in society. They were considered lower than the Herodians who were ruling over them for the Romans. They were more worthy of scorn, people thought, than the occupying soldiers that harassed them constantly. Basically, what happened? A tax collector in the Bible purchased tax franchises from Rome. Rome would say, well, from this area of the country, we want so many or so many tax dollars coming in. We need at least this. Let's bid on it so the people would come in and bid and the higher they would bid for it, the more Rome got out of it. But then they were left to raise that money in any way that they needed to. They would exert pressure. Sometimes they would hire hoodlums to go out and beat on people to get their taxes. Uh, and basically why they did that is because they had a certain amount they had to pay Rome whatever they could collect in between as they set their own rates. 
That went right here. You know, that went right in their pocket. And so tax collectors were known as, as people that were constantly preying on other people. So they, and most of them, became very wealthy doing it. Uh, basically, there were two types of tax collectors. One's called the Gobi, and the other ones were called the Makis. And these were different, they collected different taxes. The Gobbies uh, were the general tax collectors. They collected property taxes, income taxes, poll taxes. These were all set by official assessments, and so there was less graph in this area. They were not looked down on like the Makis were. Uh, the Makis collected duties on imports and exports, goods for domestic trade, and virtually anything else that moved across the roads. They set tolls on the roads, on bridges. Uh, they taxed beasts of burden that went over the roads. They would tax the axles on a wagon that went across it. You know, some of these things are still doing today if you're driving toll roads. Uh, they taxed and put tariffs on parcels, on letters, and anything else they could find to tax, they would tax. And they had the ability to do that because they had got the franchise from Rome. The assessments were always arbitrary and capricious. They could do whatever they wanted. Now there were two types of machis, machis. There were the great and the little ones. The great ones were men such as as Zacchaeus, these men stayed behind the scenes and they handed out jobs to the other people to collect for them. And so they were kind of behind the scenes. They weren't quite so well hated. How do we know he was a great uh, Marcus uh, that uh, Zacchaeus was? Because in Luke 20 or 19, 2, it said he was a chief tax collector and he was rich. That's what Luke 19, 2 says. Me, that means that he was one of these... Uh, Great uh, Machis. Now Matthew was probably what is called the little Machis. We know this because he manned the tax booth. He was the one out facing the people face to face. Uh, he was the one the people resented the most because he's the one they saw. Uh, his office, by the way, was just outside Capernaum, which was an ideal route for him. He had a great place to set up his tax office because he was on the major highway from Damascus to Jerusalem and anybody that went past him had to pay taxes on imports or exports. And something else that is quite interesting, one of the other things that were taxed oftentimes were the fish that were caught by fishermen. So guess who probably knew Matthew in a love-hate relationship? Maybe not the love, just the hate relationship. It was the apostles that had already been chosen. They would have had to pay him taxes every time they went fishing. And they wouldn't have liked it very much. And so it was, Matthew was sitting there one day, collecting his taxes, having everybody hate him. Jesus had, had just been nearby. He had... He had been preaching, the crowd was so great, and they brought a guy that had paralysis. They lowered him through the window, and Jesus healed him. And Jesus said unto them at this time, he says, Take courage, my son, your sins have been forgiven. And the people were amazed and were praising God. And as Jesus left there, he walks past a tax collector, sitting at the booth, and he looks over as he walks by, and he sees Matthew, and he says, follow me. I can see the rest of the group's head spinning around. What in the world is he doing? He's a tax collector. What are you thinking? I'm not sure, but what Matthew may have been thinking the same thing. He's calling me to follow him. 
You know, they didn't see the connection. He forgave a man that was healed. And now he's illustrating, I think, the true depth of forgiveness, true grace and calling. Matthew. Here was a sinner despised by everybody. And Jesus has come. Follow me. Be one of mine. Matthew, in return, he didn't call one of his buddies over and says, man the tables until I get back. Think about what Matthew did. This notorious sinner got up out of his chair, probably leaving the money right there on the table, and took off following Jesus. He made an abrupt, immediate change in his life, a clean break. And that's the only glimpse that really we get of Matthew's life. One of the things when he tells his own story of his life that he ignores is right after he did that, what did it say he did in Luke? Right after Jesus called him. He had a big banquet at his house. He had a big feast. And who did he invite? Well, who are you supposed to invite? He isn't going to go out and invite the religious rulers. They hated him. He wasn't going to go out, probably even if it given his choice, and invite the fishermen. They hated him. Everybody hated him. Who's he going to invite? Other tax collectors. The dredges of society. By the way, do you know tax collectors in Jewish society were considered worse than harlots? They were the bottom rung. They didn't have a lot of friends. And so he invited people that he knew. And I think, again, this illustrates how Matthew's leaving it all behind to follow him. But you know what I had a feeling? Most of these people were hungry spiritually about spiritual matters. They were interested in the money. They were working on that, but they had that. But they weren't allowed to sacrifice or worship in the temple. Even though you were a Jew, if you were a tax collector, you'd go in the court of the Gentiles, but that's as far as you could get. You were left on the outside. You were in worse shape than the Gentiles as far as the Jewish nation was concerned. I think it's also interesting to note there are only three tax collectors that are actually talked about in the scriptures. One is the story of Zacchaeus. In that one's 19, 2 through 10. The second one is the publican that's mentioned in a parable in Luke 18, 10 through 14. We're going to get to that in a minute. And the other one was Matthew. Those were the only three tax collectors. And what did they all find in common? Forgiveness. They all came to Jesus Christ and accepted forgiveness. And again, it just illustrates who God wants and who God's willing to accept anybody. It doesn't matter. He loves us all, and we will have forgiveness through Jesus Christ if we want it. Now the Pharisees and scribes found another thing against Jesus now. He says, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Showing an attitude of haughtiness in their, in their way they looked at it. Uh, they cared more about appearances than they did spiritual matters. And Jesus' response was, he says, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. Have I not come to call the I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. If people don't know they're sinners, they aren't going to be looking for help. You know, when we're well, we don't think about the doctors a whole lot. When we're sick, then we want to see a doctor. And we want help from a doctor. It's just the way it is. I think there's irony in Jesus' response. He says, I've not come to call the righteous. Well, those that think they're righteous already 
There's nothing he has to offer him. He says, I didn't come to call. I am coming to call those who need help. I think Jesus understood righteousness in your own eyes is a deathly disease. He came to save sinners. It's thought that perhaps this served as the backdrop for the parable he told later there in Luke 18, 10 through 14. It says, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying, uh, praying thus to himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other peoples, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. For I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. But he was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus says, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. It illustrates the difference. The Pharisee prayed, looking for praise of those around him, listing how he's better than everybody else. The publican just fell on his face and confessed he was a sinner. Didn't matter what everybody else was doing or saying or feeling. Now, which one's going to be exalted? Well, the one's already exalted himself. He can't be helped anymore. But it's the poor man, the one who is in the position to be lifted up, that will be exalted. One of several things uh, that Matthew had in common with some of the other apostles was the first thing he did was invited people that he wanted to hear the message of Jesus Christ. To bring others hope. His life was totally changed from the moment Jesus said, follow me. But he wanted others to have the same hope that Jesus brought him. Now I want us for a few moments to think about Matthew, the author, and some facts about this man. He started up wealthy, and he gave up everything to follow Jesus. He probably was one of the better educated of the chosen twelve. We also know that despite being banned from the temple, he was an outstanding Old Testament scholar. If you look at the book of Matthew, his gospel quotes the Old Testament some 99 times, as well as referring to it more in even more times. He quotes from the law, from the Psalms, from the prophets. Do you know he quotes more from the Old Testament? than Mark, Luke, and John do, all combined together. He's the one that's constantly quoting from the scriptures. You know, you don't learn that instantly or by uh, it being infused into you. He had studied from his personal studies most of what he knew. He not only believed in God, but he was looking for a Messiah. And when he called Jesus Christ, he, because he knew the scriptures, was able to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah. And he was just what his heart had been longing for. Basically being despised by his countrymen, his gospel in turn is directed directly at, back at them. Every one of the gospels has a target audience. And his target audience, when he writes the book of Matthew, is the Jewish people. And you will find most scholars believe that when he went out from Jerusalem, he was the one that was working with the Jewish people instead of the Gentiles. Because he is the one that was equipped to do that. And so what becomes the thread 
that runs all the way through Matthew is this, the, that thread of forgiveness. Matthew is a man is able to forgive the Jewish people. The ones that have put him down and scoffed at him for years, he's able to forgive them enough that he wrote a book to try to reach them. That's a lot to be said. Now let me give you a few of the facts and fiction. We always have to do this a little bit. Some of this is, is pretty good. Other than the book that bears his name, we learn little about Matthew's life in ministry and what happened to him. You know, people talk about when he wrote his book. Well, there's a book that is called the Didache, which is the teaching of the 12 apostles. It's dated by most scholars about 80 AD. So they know his book was written for it because a lot of it is quotes from Matthew's gospel. So he was well recognized as an authority in the early church. Pappus, the bishop of uh, Hierapolis, who lived from 60 to 135 AD, claimed that his book was written in Hebrew and it had to be translated into Greek by anybody that was using it. Uh, Irenaeus, who lived from 11 uh, or 115 to 202 uh, in what was now Lyons, France, claimed that Matthew issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect while Paul was preaching in Rome. In other words, what Paul or Matthew did when he sat down to write is he wrote in the language of the people he was trying to reach, the Hebrew people. Uh, Christian theologian Origen, who lived from 185 to 254, I'm giving you these dates to realize these are people that are probably 100, 150 years removed from, from Paul, or from Paul, from Matthew. And so they don't have, you know, you can't say they knew exactly what he was doing, because you don't. But he said this, and I, I'll quote him for you. Among the four Gospels, which are the only indisputable ones in the church of God under heaven, I have learned by tradition that the first written according to Matthew, the same was once a tax collector, but afterwards an emissary of Jesus, the Messiah, who having published it for the Jewish believers, wrote it in Hebrew. Uh, he did it on purpose. Matthew as a tax collector was, a, was an arm of the government. He was a government official. He probably would have done his business normally in Greek and in Aramaic, which were the, the language of the marketplace in those days. And this well illustrates then that his target audience is the Jewish people. One term, and I, I'm just picking this out, this is a reason, that is kind of unique to Matthew in his writing, is he always and talks very often about the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Jesus and John are both, he quotes, is using this term. Uh, I think it's interesting as I was looking at some of this, that I ran across Ian Fleck, and I found what he said is very interesting. He says, this indicates, because it tells us what they meant by that, this indicates that the Jews understood the meaning of the kingdom. The idea of kingship comes from the Old Testament. The kingdom of heaven is the rule and reign of God and his divine order on earth. In the New Testament, the kingdom of heaven is past, present, and future. Okay, what happened then to Matthew? Well, we don't know. Uh, most of the apostles stayed in Jerusalem for about 12 years after the ascension, so he was probably in Jerusalem for 12 years. Tradition says he traveled into Egypt, in Ethiopia, maybe as far as India. We don't know. You know, that's, that's tradition, but we don't really know. It's believed that he spent the last 23 years in Egypt and Ethiopia, and it's believed he died in Ethiopia about AD 90 during the reign of uh, Domitian. Uh, and it's said that he often ministered to kings and high government officials. That's tradition. We can't base fact on that. 
some say he died in peace. Others says he was stabbed to death. Others said he was still killed with the spear. Others said he was burned at the stake. So who knows how he actually died. The one thing we can be certain of, though, is that he did die. You know, we can be certain of that, but we can't be certain of how. Matthew was a sinner who lived in a profession of dishonesty and greed. He was a man of wealth and economic security. They gave everything up when Jesus called. It changed his life, and there was never any turning back for Matthew. We are greatly blessed today by his gospel that he left behind, that we too might experience the life-changing power that Jesus brings to change lives.